It was the first American frontier. It is a landscape, a culture, a frame of mind. When you look within these hills, I see the people. These beautiful people who came from a variety of European traditions, who came seeking a vastness of freedom, whether it was land opportunities or religious freedom, they came. They came and they carved out an existence. Appalachia is good times and hard times. It is fiddle music and clogging and the face of a hungry child. Oh, hey, cucumbers, I'll get up, old guitar, and here we go. Pick them up. Appalachia is a flood of stereotypes. <laughs> From the ignorant hillbilly to the heroic mountaineer. We've been looked down upon laughed at, scorned, made fun of, called hillbillies. And the people have here the steadfast faith. They're used to hard times. Living kind of an isolated existence has a lot to do with the fact that Appalachian Mountain people are so unique in their love of their fellow man and the way they treat their fellow man. They take care of each other. If I was on some foggy mountain top, I'd sail away to the west. I'd sail all around this whole wide world to the girl I love the best. Appalachia is story and song. It is music that beats like the heart of America. If you want to go back to where the dignity and where the absolute blue blaze of the blueprint of country music is, it's in the inside of that old style of music. Appalachian music is a rich, incredibly rich American heritage that can't afford, we cannot afford to ignore it, you know? It's, it's part of who we are. In a land rich in culture and natural bounty, many people have suffered devastating poverty. How did this corner of America become such a portrait in contrasts? The history of Appalachia is a history of an industrial people of people helping to build modern America, but who failed to benefit from the work that they put in. The region can be defined based on how people who had power and wealth been able to take the power and wealth and drain resources. Coal, lumber, seeps out. The land has been raped in a sense. There's been so much wealth here, it's been taken out of the state and nothing has been left. One of the real ironies is how we could experience the exploitation and the trauma of our development past and yet continue to survive so strongly as a culture, continue to thrive in terms of who we are as a people. What we did have was a deep understanding of ourselves and our family. We may not have been mobile, we were not, but we were centered and we were grounded. That's our gift to the rest of the nation. This is the story of a land shaped by the people and a people shaped by the land. The Appalachian mountain range is nearly 400 million years old. This place is ragged and torn and 
rumpled. This landscape is one of the most ancient in, in the world. For more than 1,500 miles, the chain snakes down from Canada through New York, Pennsylvania, and all of West Virginia. Large parts of Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, Maryland, and the Carolinas are dominated by the rugged Alleghenies and Cumberlands, the soaring Blue Ridge, and the Great Smoky Mountains to the south. All these ridges, gorges, and valleys came to be known collectively as Appalachia, a region as mysterious as it was remote. The mountain remains unmoved at its seeming defeat by the mist. Robert Penn Warren. Early in the 17th century, a small number of Europeans began to explore and settle this great wilderness. But they were not the first to call Appalachia their home. Appalachians today include many different kinds of people, but we need to remember that the first people in the Appalachian Highlands were the ancestors of today's American Indians. So the original Appalachians are in fact Native Americans. Before the Europeans arrived, Appalachia was home to many Indian tribes. There were Shawnee, Choctaw, and Creek, but the dominant tribe was the Cherokee. These were very complex cultures. They were grounded in a belief system that tied human beings to a particular place. Their view is that this is the land that was created for them, that this is the land where they belong. The Cherokee were mostly farmers, settled in villages and growing crops in the garden. They were proud of who they were, but not only were they proud and, and very strong people, they were very intelligent. They call us a civilized tribe, which is fine, but they don't ever see us as being very warrior-like. You don't become part owner of seven states by being meek and, and somewhat passive. One surprise for the newcomers was the authority that women had in the matrilineal Cherokee society. Women generally had control of the corn crop. That is, women had economic control of the staple of Cherokee life. Men lived in the households of their wives. And a man's heirs were his sister's children, not his own children. If a man from one clan married a woman in another clan, then he joined her clan and their children became members of her clan. Older Cherokee women were quite often a part of the council, so women had a great deal of autonomy, and they lost that as they became acculturated into the European society. Kinship was all important to the native people. If a member of one tribe was killed by a member of another, this was a cause for war. But it was not war in the way that Europeans understood it or in the way that we understand it today. Southern Indians did not fight to conquer, to expand their kingdoms, or to inflict their own religion or ideology on other people. They went to war to avenge the death of kin. The Cherokees saw people as either relatives or enemies, but tradition allowed them to bring outsiders into the tribe. Captives taken in battle would be adopted into a Cherokee clan. The same was done with black slaves who escaped into Cherokee country. Some former slaves who escaped were treated as brothers, and they were able to you know, become part of the tribe and, and, and dissipate you know, over time a generation. Many European traders managed to join the local tribe in another way, by marrying Cherokee women. 
even if you had been born a Creek, or you had been born an Englishman, or you had been born an, an African American slave, once you were adopted into a Cherokee clan, you were a member of that clan and a Cherokee, and your children were going to be Cherokee. That is, race as Europeans came to understand it had very little meaning in 18th century Cherokee society. For decades, Indians and traders lived in relative harmony on the Appalachian frontier, buying and selling goods and sharing the bounty of the land. But for many back in Europe, life was growing more and more oppressive. Open territory in the New World was very inviting to people seeking freedom, independence, and a piece of land to call their own. They were a grim, stern people, strong and simple, swayed by gusts of stormy passion the love of freedom rooted in their heart's core. They were of all men best fitted to conquer the wilderness and hold it against all comers. Teddy Roosevelt. It was in the 1730s that the ancestors of today's Appalachians began streaming into the mountains. To escape hard times, they came from Germany, England, and Wales. But the group that would become most prominent in the mountains started their journey off the rugged coast of Northern Ireland. A bit of Irish history accounts for the exodus. A hundred years earlier, King James of England had grown tired of battling rebellious Scots in the lowlands. The king thought he could use the Scots as a hedge against the bothersome Irish, so he offered them free farmsteads in Ulster, in the north of Ireland. What better thing to do than to get some of the borderland Scots who were always giving you trouble to go over and whoop up on the Irish. So they took advantage of it, moved to Ulster, got farms, and they became known as Scotch-Irish. For about 100 years, the Scotch merged with the Irish. They mixed their words, they mixed their phrases, they mixed their horse racing love. They took, in many ways, the best qualities of both people. After a century in Ulster, the Scotch-Irish were suffering religious persecution, rising rents, and bad harvests. Tens of thousands moved on to a second migration to the New World. This hybrid culture took root in the southern mountain wilderness of Appalachia. safe and sound, and here in peace, so oh, we hope to be with the Indian tribes in old Tennessee. The Scots-Irish were very quick to be among the first settlers who actually made their permanent home in the mountains those mountains that had the funny, smoky look in the morning. When we were got up to the top of the mountain and set down very weary, we saw very high mountains lying to the north and south as far as we could discern. It was a pleasing, though dreadful sight, to see mountains and hills as if piled one upon the other. Robert Fallon, 1671. Now I've nothing stray 
change ought to write to you. Well, the preaching's scarce, so and religion too. But we've better land and a fertile soil. We've got honey, milk, we've corn and oil. Once they'd made their permanent home in the mountains, they by no means were the only ones that settled in there, but they were the most colorful most influential. You had the other mix of the Germans who came here, and the Germans are known for their orderliness and, uh, you know, their rules for everything and building really staunch barns uh, out of material that will last. The Scotch-Irish, on the other hand, tended to be more footloose and fancy-free, and the Scotch-Irish also were more hot-tempered than the Germans. And so when the Indians attacked, you wanted Scotch-Irish there because they were terrific fighters. But uh, it, when the Indians weren't there, the Germans were just as happy not to have the Scotch-Irish around. It was said at the time that whereas the English, when they got to America, would build a church, the Germans would build a barn, but the Scotch-Irish would build a whiskey still. It's when I'm dead and in my grave No more corn liquor will I crave Upon my tombstone I want it rose Ten thousand gallons went down my throat Whiskey making was only one of the skills that the frontier migrants brought from the old world. With traditional crafts like quilting, pottery and metalwork. They furnished their homes and cooked their meals as they always had. But the tradition closest to their hearts was music. Music was especially important. It gave them comfort. It was something that they could do themselves. They could sing, they could play their fiddles and have a dance and invite the neighbors over. The most important instrument the Scotch-Irish brought with them was the fiddle. Small, portable, and plaintive. The old fiddle tunes were greatly beloved and passed along through the generations. Those were the kind of songs that Thomas Jefferson probably played his fiddle by. And they were handed down, the reels and the jigs and the, the airs and the beautiful songs. I was playing with the Chieftains one day, and I was playing this bone and, and Sean Keane from the group said, where did you learn that? And I said, from an old man in Eastern Kentucky. He said, that's the way they play in Donegal. And uh, I was so flipped out, you know, to realize that that had come over here centuries ago. Along with fiddle music, many well-loved ballads made the long, hard trip across the ocean. In Scotland I was dwelling. I fell in love with a pretty fair maid, and her name was Barbara Allen. As people packed up to make the journey to the New World, they had to leave almost everything behind. There wasn't enough room on the ship for anything, but there was enough room on that ship to memorize a few dozen songs. Singing those songs or playing those tunes made them feel uh, at home. You know, they had brought that part of their culture with them. Oh, mother, oh, mother, go dig my grave. Go dig it long and narrow. Sweet William died for me today. I'll die for him tomorrow. The ballads, of course, are basically narrative songs or story songs. Many of them go back in England 
as far back as the days of Shakespeare. You know, it comes from the troubadours in England, like 14th, 15th, 16th century. They traveled the country. They would stop at a farmhouse. They would write a song for the person who lived there. That's what they had to say about the troubadour. He always paid his way. They didn't say that he paid his way with a song, but he did for a warm bed and breakfast in the morning. We still kind of do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. We do, don't we? <laughs> Those songs didn't die off in the mountains. They stayed in the mountains. Many of these songs dealt with the same kind of archetypal themes that soap operas today deal with. Deception, betrayal, murder, and true love. Barbara Allen is the classic example. If your name be Barbara Allen. Later on, we begin to get songs that dealt with topical subjects, especially as Americans began to take hold of the models of the old songs and create new songs around them. That's the only way you, you passed it down, was to write about it. If anything happened, if someone got killed, there would be a song wrote about it. This man got this girl pregnant, and it's a true song. He was going to marry her, or he told her he was going to marry her. That was what the story was about. And uh, they went out walking on a Sunday afternoon, and he threw her in the river, the old high river. I asked my love to take a walk Just to walk a little ways And as we walk, oh, may we talk All about our wedding day Americans tended to change the songs. If you're going to have fun singing a good ballad, you've got to learn something from it. So on many American songs, you have tied on to the end of the ballad a moral. Down by the banks of the Ohio. Banks of the Ohio. The man takes the woman down to the banks of the Ohio and uh, pushes her in to drown. And I watched her as she floated down. Well, he's ultimately ap apprehended, but you know, that's pretty direct. And only say that you'll be mine. In no other's arms incline Down beside where the waters go Down by the banks of the Ohio It's one of those songs that has about a hundred verses. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think he kills her, right? Mm, killed her. Killed her. Plunged his knife into her breast. <laughs> It's a hard thing to, to put into words. I think partly because there are all these isolated areas, different hollers in the mountains, where people got together and made music for themselves. I think thing that other parts of the country tends to get uh, diluted in different ways, and some of the mountains, I think, uh, held some tradition in, in a way. I just always imagine in my mind when I hear this, this music, I think about the, the journey that the musical style took and, and how, how it got changed in the mountains. I think about the time travel of that, of that music and, and uh, it's beautiful stuff. The same rugged mountains that held and nurtured music and culture also marked the western boundary of colonial America. These settlers who had come from the borderlands of England were living again on the edge of two worlds. But 
the rich land beyond the hills was bound to call to the adventurous pioneer. We're going west to gain tuck down the road through Moccasin Gap, down the wilderness road, the Duck Road, the only the Creek Road, the road down troublesome road through Moccasin Gap. There was a time when going way out west meant going out to Cane Tuck, the dark and bloody ground, as the Indians called it. In 1769, a backcountry explorer forged his way across the Alleghenies. After traveling dark wilderness trails for five weeks, he and his men came upon a most remarkable sight. I had gained the summit of a commanding ridge, and looking round with astonishing delight, beheld the ample plains, the beauteous tracks below. Daniel Boone. Boone could see that the territory was ripe for farming. And six years later, he established a settlement in Kentucky. He was flatly defying British orders to stay east of the Alleghenies and avoid the French, who held lands to the west. The English weren't the only ones who resisted westward expansion. For the Cherokee, keeping the colonists east of the Alleghenies was a matter of survival. Whole Indian nations have melted away like snowballs in the sun before the white man's advance. We had hoped that the white man would not be willing to travel beyond the mountains. Now, that hope is gone. Dragging Canoe, 1775. Land was the most important reason, but not the only one, for the rising anger the Cherokee felt against the whites. In the 1730s, European diseases had wiped out more than a third of the Cherokee tribe. And the tribe was losing many of its traditions. They had always prospered by hunting, growing, or making everything they needed to live. But by this time, they were selling great volumes of deer skins to the traders in return for fabrics, metal tools, and copper kettles. They had started to resent being so dependent on European goods. My people cannot live independent of the English. The clothes we wear, we cannot make ourselves. They are made for us. We use their ammunition with which to kill deer. We cannot make our own guns. Every necessary of life we must have from the white people. Chief Skiagunsta, 1745. Throughout the 18th century, English, French, settlers, and Indians were mired in combat in Appalachia. It was said a man could live from boyhood to old age and never know a time of peace. The culminating battle began when the colonies declared their independence in 1776. The American Revolution was hard fought in the mountains by all the friends and foes of the colonial cause. Many Cherokee looked to the British as their allies. They found themselves on the opposite side of the frontiersmen who had learned so well to fight in Indian style. In the American Revolution, the Cherokees were divided. Most favored the British because in 1763, the king had issued a proclamation that prohibited westward expansion. Now, this infuriated many of the colonists, but from the Indian perspective, the king was standing up for their rights. The British searched in every quarter for people who remained loyal to the king. We have to remember that the revolution was a civil war. There were people on both sides. By and large, the people who were on the side of the crown or who were neutral or indifferent in Appalachia did not take up arms. One of the assumptions of the British army that invaded the South in the 1780s 
was that if they reached the back country, that the loyalists there would rise up, and that didn't happen. Most of the mountaineers, especially the Scotch-Irish, were fiercely committed to throwing over British rule. They were among the first to sign up when George Washington sent out the call for troops. The Scotch-Irish had declared that these colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent. And it was from these that came that outburst of rugged and determined people that made the Declaration of 1776 possible. Colonel A.K. McClure, newspaper editor. The most famous backcountry fighters were the Overmountain men of Tennessee, who defeated the stalwart Colonel Ferguson at the Battle of Kings Mountain in South Carolina. Ferguson had threatened to cross the Appalachians and exterminate the people if they didn't support the king. In his proclamation, he called the mountaineers white barbarians. To the colonel's surprise, the barbarians charged his forces, seeking cover behind rocks and chasing the soldiers up the mountain, tree by tree. They killed nearly 200 British troops including Colonel Ferguson. Well, they won. They won because they adopted the Indian style of warfare, as they had before. Uh, and they won because the loyalists uh, in the backwoods didn't rise up in support uh, of the British Army. The surprise victory snuffed out British hopes for taking the South and was a critical turning point in making America the land of the free. George Washington said if he ever had to make a last stand, he would want to stand with the Over Mountain Boys, who knew how to shoot and fight. When the Revolution was over, land that the Indians had fought so hard to save officially became part of the new country. The Indians had chosen the wrong side. The British support was not sustained, and the British cut them off at the knees, we would say today, when the Peace Treaty of Paris in 1783 was announced and gave the United States what was, from the Indian standpoint, their land. The revolution was a turning point for Appalachia. The region headed into a period of significant growth and change. Thousands of soldiers were rewarded with free homesteads, bringing a flood of new settlers to the mountains. And the proud mountaineer would soon find himself doing battle with the very government he had just helped bring to power. Come on, all you booze fighters, if you want to hear about the kind of booze that we sell around here. It's made way back in the swamps and the hills where there's plenty of moonshine still. The Scotsman had always known how to make liquor from barley and rye. They quickly learned to use Indian crops instead, wheat and corn, berries and potatoes, just about anything that grew. Selling whiskey was good business, much more profitable than selling any of the bulky raw crops. But George Washington's government was buried in debt, and one of the ways they tried to pay it off was with a tax on whiskey. The settlers of the Western country were so opposed to this tax because it was very reminiscent of the taxes that were imposed on the colonists under the rule of King George of England. And the people that were on the frontier were the rugged individualists, they were the veterans of the American Revolution that fought to establish this country. They were very jealous of their property and their rights. They valued freedom. They did not want to be told what to do by, by anyone. A string of violent protests broke out from New York to Georgia. It became known as the Whiskey Rebellion, and it raged from 1791 to 1794. The new tax was not to be tolerated. It was a tax that was required to be paid in cash and cash was scarce on the frontier. Whiskey 
was a commodity that was used as money. Ministers were known to even accept payment for their Sunday services with whiskey. One drop will make a rabbit whip a bulldog. One drop will make a cat chase a wild hog. Make a bullfrog spit in a black snake's face and make a hard shell preacher fall from grace. It would be not uncommon when a federal tax collector would come here that they would tar and feather him. One violent outbreak in the Western Carolina region, they actually took the uh, excise tax collector and ground his nose off at a grinding wheel. And the lamb will lay down with the lion after drinking this old moonshine. This was a fight the settlers could not win. Washington took 13,000 troops into western Pennsylvania under his personal command. It was an army as big as the one that had fought the revolution. The rebellious moonshiners were crushed. Rules and regulations were bound to be imposed on these people who wanted to believe they could just be left alone. The Appalachian mountaineer could grow or make everything he needed to survive. He had learned to rely on himself and did not want outsiders dictating how he was to think or behave in politics or in religion. Just as the stubborn pioneer bridled at government authority, he also had little use for the old world hierarchy of the church. He would follow the call of his spirit and find his own way to God. The mountain legacy of independent thinking about religion continues to this day in the astonishing variety of churches still to be found in Appalachia. Appalachia is a really marvelously diverse religiously. Particularly central Appalachia may be one of the most religiously diverse areas of the nation. Baptists, for example, we've got well over 40 varieties of Baptists. Regular Baptists, Old Regular Baptists, United Baptists, Union Baptists, Separate Baptists, Two Seed in the Spirit Predestinarian Baptists. In many mountain churches, religion is intensely physical and emotional. People continue to practice religious exercises that date back hundreds of years. This bodily expression and the wide array of sects first took root in the dynamic religious activity of the 18th and 19th centuries. Immigrants had arrived in Appalachia with different traditions. There were Anglicans and Baptists from England, from Germany, a range of Protestant groups, and the Scotch-Irish were mostly Presbyterian. But the established churches could not find a foothold on the frontier, where distances were great and communication difficult. For a few generations, worship was held inside the family or in the most humble mountain chapel. The religion most had carried with them was Calvinistic, tough, dark, and demanding. John Calvin imagined that God was all-powerful, knew all things, had predestined all things, and who knew who would be saved and who wouldn't be saved. But it was a grim theology in a way because you might not be among the elect. God was only going to save a remnant of the human race. People like John Wesley, one of the founders of Methodism, had been spreading newer ideas through Europe. 
especially the notions of a gentler God and human free will. The old intellectual Calvinism started giving way to this new thought that God is all loving, God would like to save us all. All we have to do is repent and ask for forgiveness and we can be saved. That's the doctrine of free will, that we have it upon ourselves to decide whether or not to be saved. Well, this is more optimistic. People could get happy with religion. By the 1740s, this more hopeful vision was spreading like burning tinder through the mountains. There began a long series of evangelical or enthusiastic religious revivals known as the Great Awakenings that would last more than 80 years. Ministers of every stripe swarmed into Appalachia, bound to bring the unchurched into the fold. Most of these people had never before seen a minister or heard the Lord's Prayer, service or sermon in their days. After service, they went to reveling, drinking, singing, dancing and whoring. And most of the company were drunk before I quitted the spot. Charles Woodmason, Minister, 1768. Presbyterians did not have enough educated ministers to reach the far-flung population. The Baptists and Methodists were more successful because they commissioned farmer preachers and sent them off into the mountains. They were called the circuit riders. They spoke a common language with the people they were trying to convert and inspired them to gather together for worship. Long ago when but a boy at old camp meeting time. By 1800, the revival had found its most powerful outlet. Settlers left the hills by the thousands, on foot, on horseback, in the family wagon. They traveled long days to the great camp meetings under the mountain sky. I like the old worship of the Lord. Up in Cane Ridge, Kentucky, around Lexington, the Cane Ridge Revival had 25,000 people in 1801, which the population of Lexington, Kentucky, was about 5,000 people at that time. So people came from miles and miles and miles away. That was what was considered the first camp meetings. The meeting was remarkably lively, and many souls were deeply wrought upon. And at the close of the sermon, there was a general cry for mercy. The meeting continued all night, both by white and black people, and many souls were converted before day. Jesse Lee, 1807. I like the old times, worship of the Lord. People barked like dogs and yipped and shouted and climbed trees and and scratched the bark and did all sorts of things to demonstrate that they had the Holy Ghost and really had got religion, you know, because it needed to be emotional. And that spread to all the churches, this need for an emotional salvation. Since the days of the Great Awakenings, Baptists and Methodists have been the largest religious groups in Appalachia. And all through the mountains, the tent meeting tradition lives on after 200 years. We were out traveling around these back roads. There was a revival meeting. There were tiny tents. And we passed one one night, and it was just you know a little two-pole tent with a couple of light bulbs and probably 20 people there. But I could hear the preacher. I mean, he was preaching like there was you know 25,000 people there. It reminded me of the scripture, what it talked about, about John the Baptist in the wilderness, a voice crying out in the wilderness.
God and music go hand in hand. If you don't believe it, read Psalms. I mean, God is the creator of all beautiful things. And music being one of the most beautiful gifts I think this earth could ever have. Music is our hope and our salvation in awfully hard times of struggle. When you're living on the side of a mountain and you have a skinny mule trying to plow, I mean, horrible land that's barely feeding your babies, and uh, you know, you got to have something to hope in. Oh man, what a wonderful thing to be able to go to church and talk to our Creator by way of music. The same revivals that energized the spirit would also transform religious music on the frontier. Like the ballads, religious songs were an essential part of life that had been carried from the old world, along with the traditional style of singing. A lot of times there's a call and answer, a leader would sing, uh, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Everybody together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a rich like me. That saved a rich like me. A lot of the music in the early colonial period was lined out him. Uh, hymnody where somebody would uh, uh, give you the words to the song and you would sing a phrase and then they would chant the second phrase uh, or line and then you would sing that. Was blind but now I see all together. Was blind but now I see. If you were not able to read or couldn't afford hymn books, you could still sing along with lined out hymn. Even today, groups like the Primitive Baptist Universalists can be heard simply and humbly singing the Lord's Word. And we still have that coming down almost as an orthodox thing, that we still line out the hymns and you sing monophonically. You don't sing in harmony. That's showing off. Glorious complex harmonies did become popular later on when a new system was created to help people learn the hymns. It was a special kind of notation, a visual form called shape note music and it quickly spread through the mountain churches. Shape note singing was a simplified way that people could learn to read music and be precise about music. You could read the notes either by looking at the kind of shape it was, or if you could still read on, on lines on staff, you could read them that way. Singers sat in a hollow square with the leader in the middle. Shape note music used a limited scale, which gave it its unusual sound. You sing the song through the first time by note. So you'll hear a group of people singing, fa, fa, so, la, so, fa, fa, fa. And you'll wonder, what's going on? And they'll, they'll go through it that way, and then they'll come back and they'll sing the words. Tennessee, Kentucky, and Alabama became centers for this kind of music, and it still is today. By the end of the Great Awakenings, a very different sound was echoing through the mountain hollers. If I was a preacher, I'd tell you what I would do. I'd keep on preaching and I'd work on the building too. I'm working on the building. 
as white and black people mingled at revival meetings. The white musicians picked up on African rhythms. It's a Holy Ghost it's a Holy Ghost they created blood-stirring songs to fit the new emotional religion. Songs that would become classics of gospel and bluegrass. It's a Holy Ghost Today, we are still hearing the sound of the revivals echo through country music after 200 years. Soldier of the cross, soldier of the cross, you carry the sword of faith. Soldier of the cross. There is no greater influence on early country music than gospel music. It was the deepest well from which musicians drew. We bring love to those who hate. And it was not only the song material, it was the way of singing, of very emotive singing. When you put the secular tradition together with the religious tradition, you see so many antecedents of what we know as country music, and they're still there today. What's it gonna be? What's it gonna be? Heaven or hell? He's a stranger in this valley where many a man met his grave. And the music of the spirit, music of the heart carrying memories of a distant home. Songs that tell of hard times, of stormy passions, and a deep devotion to God. From the days of the first pioneers, music has been a binding force in the Southern Mountains. It is a gift to all the world from the people of Appalachia. Production of the Appalachians is made possible by grants from the United States Department of Veterans Affairs, the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, the Vandalia Heritage Foundation, promoting historic preservation and development, the Sierra Club, which is a proud partner in local community efforts to protect this treasured land, and the Mountain Maid Foundation, promoting West Virginia arts and crafts, Additional funding was provided by the Robert H. Mollahan Family Charitable Foundation, the Appalachian Regional Commission, the West Virginia High Technology Consortium Foundation, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. <laughs>